Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15, please. And I'm going to begin reading there at verse 11 down through verse 32, the end of that chapter. And if you read your Bible, you should be familiar with this story we're going to consider today. Luke 15 and starting at verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answered, and he, excuse me, and he answering said to him, Father, lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the story of the prodigal son, one of the most well-known stories the Lord Jesus ever spoke, or parables, I say, that he, should, that he spoke. The story of a son who squandered his inheritance, but then was for, forgiven by his father. It's the story of a father who never stopped loving that son, never stopped praying for him. Every day he was gone, hoping he wasn't getting into too much trouble, hoping he wasn't disgracing the family name too badly or getting arrested or any number of things that might have befell him. It's the story of the older brother who was envious and jealous when the wandering brother finally came home. It's a real lesson in humility. The younger son had to get as low as he could before he could see his own life more clearly. And uh, it's a story of a father's compassion on a son who didn't deserve it. And that son knew he didn't deserve it, but he received it anyway. There have been some great 
sermons preached over the generations on this text, and they've drawn out some wonderful spiritual lessons and observations about the Christian life from it. And this probably won't rank uh, among even the top 10 sermons you'll ever hear on the text, but hopefully it'll do some good to someone today. The implication is clear. It's a picture of some sinner who thought he would be happy without God. He thought he would be happy without the things of God and the influences of the Word of God and certainly not Jesus Christ, only to find out that he wasn't truly happy until he made things right with God. And so I call this sermon today, Before and After. Before and After. It's a story of a younger brother. It's a story of any sinner, young or old, who thinks happiness means no God, no religion, no church, no authority, no rules. Do whatever you want to do and uh, ask, other, ask other people to mind their own business, keep their opinions to themselves, only to find out how wrong you really were to think that way. But point number one, before he wanted freedom, but became a slave. He wanted freedom, but became a slave. You might want to be free from your parents' rules and their authority over you when you're young, only to become a slave to the job you hate, a job you wish you could leave, but now you're dependent on it because you've stated your independence and you say, I don't need mom and dad. I don't want any rules. I don't need anyone else to look after me. I'll look out for myself, only to find out how uh, obligated you are to that job that doesn't really satisfy you or some occupation. You can't break free from it, otherwise the bills will go unpaid. So now you're stuck. You've got no one to help. Someone has said every freedom has a corresponding bondage. For example, you could be free from your toothbrush. That's a pain to brush your teeth two or three times a day. Or once a week like my brother does. I'm just kidding you only to become a slave to cavities. You know, if you don't have any teeth anymore, then you don't have to worry about the toothbrush. But you don't want to get to that point. An athlete can be free from exercise and discipline and, and training, but not if he wants to excel at the sport. The Bible personifies sin as a taskmaster uh, that will either rule over you or you will rule over it. The Lord told Cain, Genesis 4, verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. There's a struggle inside someone who's trying to control his own actions, his own bad habits. He thinks he's in charge. Sometimes he feels as though he is, and other times he knows he's not in charge. The Lord Jesus warned, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. John 8, verse 34. The Apostle Paul wrote, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto unto righteousness, Romans 6, verse 16. So there again, sin is personified as either ruling over you or righteousness will rule over you. But sin can become your master. There's an old proverb that says, man takes drink, then drink takes drink, and eventually drink takes man. Someone with an alcohol problem, smoking problem, drugs, or pornography. He never thought he would take control of him like it does. And now he doesn't feel normal unless he's doing the very same, th the very thing he knows he shouldn't be doing. This is how sin can be. He wanted freedom, but became a slave. 
In this young man's story, he thought he'd be having a good time all the time. But before he knew it, he was lower than the servants back home. Verse 15, And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Well, that was no way for a Jewish young man to end up. He wanted freedom, but he became a slave. Secondly, let me say this. Before, he wanted to feast, but became famished. To be famished is to be hungry and desperate, trying to find just enough to eat that day. Verse 14 says, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Verse 16 and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. What began as a big party with lots of food, lots of booze, became a life or death situation for him. Verse 17, he realized, I perish with hunger. You know, a life without God or without Christ can be a life just like that. You can be a spiritual beggar. We talked about that last Sunday. The old places you spent your time at, they don't give you the kind of thrill anymore. They're not as exciting as they used to be. The music, the movies, the dance clubs, the sports events, the basketball games, the television shows, whatever's on the radio, those things don't satisfy you the way you thought they would. They leave you empty every time you pursue them. They may make you feel numb and a little excited for a while, but then next week you go back, seek it again, because they're not lasting. It begins to leave you empty every time you go to it. No matter how many concerts you attend, no matter how many movies you watch, none of it can give you a real uh, satisfying reason to go on living. They really can't. Life becomes boring. He wanted to feast, but he became famished. Thirdly, let me say this before, he wanted to be merry, but became miserable. Verse 16 in our text. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Very often in the Bible, Mary refers to the kind of false artificial happiness that comes from drinking too much. When they say Merry Christmas, it takes on a whole new meaning now, doesn't it? The Bible says, And they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry, Judges 19, verse 6. But that kind of merriment uh, usually leads to bad judgment. It leads to sin. And it leads to a lot of regrets later on. Solomon warns, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, Proverbs 20, verse 1. Our text said in verse 13 that, quote, He took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Wherever he went, his brother, older brother back home knew what he was up to. He knew where he had gone. He knew what he planned to do. He complained to his father later on, verse 30, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. He knew where his brother was going. He knew the neighborhood he could find a loose woman on the street corner. He knew where he could go and satisfy his flesh. The young man looked forward to being able to drink. He looked forward to being merry with all of his friends or drunk, which led to fornication, which led to uh, uh, headaches and probably a new tattoo when he woke up that next day. The threat of catching VD. To make matters worse, now he was broke. Now he was out of money. But life without Jesus Christ is a life of misery. Amen. It really is. It may seem like a joyful 
time, happy time, but it doesn't last forever. When you sin, and you know you're guilty, unless you make peace with God and find forgiveness, you can put on a smile and make people think you're doing all right, but inside you're as empty as you can possibly be. You need the Bible. You need to pray. You need to be with other Christians. You need to sing the praise and the worship songs to God. You need to enjoy the, the uh, fellowship of other believers wherever possible and as often as possible. But not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The, the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, the more you should want to do those things which will please him if he should come back right now. Would he be happy if he came back now, right now to catch you doing what you're doing right now? Do you have that thought in your mind as you go through the day? When you drive here, when you drive there, the way you talk with people at work, the way you talk to people at school, the way you uh, behave in your own house, in your own neighborhood. Are you spending all of your brain cells and free time on things that are not becoming of a Christian, things that would be embarrassing if the Lord Jesus Christ were to catch you doing it, and you'd be ashamed of. You and I are bound together in the same body of believers. We're knit together as the bride of Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. All saints collectively make up the church. And therefore, I have an obligation to you you have an obligation to me. Romans 14 verse uh, 7 says, there, uh, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. If I do something that is not becoming of a true believer, it's not becoming of Jesus Christ, it's less than the, the acceptable virtue that God would accept, it's a little bit questionable, then that reflects negatively on you. Because you and I are bound together. When somebody gets uh, offended by you as a Christian, you know what they want to do? They want to broad brush and uh, describe all Christians as being like that. The idea that, well, I'll live my Christian life by myself and you mind your own business. You can't do that. You can't expect Christians to keep their mouths shut when, your when their reputation is largely dependent upon your actions and yours on theirs. The Bible describes Moses, quote, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews eleven twenty five. Yeah, sin can be pleasurable for a season. It satisfies the flesh. It satisfies the flesh. And it strokes the ego for a little while and makes you think, well, I got away with it this time and no harm has come to me. And I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. So everything's fine and dandy. Meanwhile, you're getting farther and farther and farther away from Jesus Christ, and you are not in close fellowship with him as you used to be. Sin can make you feel merry for a while, but then it comes the misery and the regrets. Even religion can be a temporary happiness, unless you know where you're going, and you know the Savior who can get you there. I... Uh, I work for a funeral home during the week. Yesterday I had to work a Catholic funeral and uh, the deceased had been a, a football coach, high school age, uh, college age football coach. And uh, the way the priest eulogized him was, Jesus was a coach in a way. He coached the 12 disciples on how to get to heaven. And uh, then he talked about what a great fellow this deceased was. And uh, you know, he gets to the end. Uh, he said he finally scored the ultimate touchdown. And then he says, uh, and Christ welcomed him to heaven just like this. Like the statue they have, like the statue they have at Notre Dame, they, they nickname it the touchdown Jesus. Can you imagine somebody being that idiotic 
in his treatment of the scriptures, somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ, he'd never been, been, been born again, he's on his way to hell. What more can he say? But um, before, he wanted to be merry, but he became miserable. Look at verses 17, 18, and 19 once again. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Too many people are stubborn, they're hard-headed, they're filled with too much pride to admit that the problem is theirs. The problem is of their own making. The reason they're miserable, the reason they're, they feel distant from God, the reason Bible reading isn't enjoyable to them anymore, the reason they don't spend any time praying to God is because they know they're out of fellowship with God. Yeah. And they know it's their fault, but they have too much pride to admit it. They won't allow, them, allow the Holy Spirit to break them down and come to God and say, God, I've been wasting my time, I've been fooling around, and I haven't taken you seriously or taken your word seriously, taken your will seriously, taken the kind word or the recommendations of my Christian friends who care about me seriously. And I've not got no one to blame but myself. They don't admit they need help. Don't they say admitting you need help is the first step to getting help and AA and so forth? They don't want to admit that they were wrong and maybe somebody else was right. King David wrote, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, verse 5. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Just like the young man in this text he had to humble himself and go back to his father. Uh, so too, every sinner has to recognize his guilt before God. If you're guilty of sin, then you know you need to be forgiven of sin. That's the first step to going where you're going to find forgiveness. You can't find it anywhere else except at the foot of Calvary's cross. Amen. And the story of the prodigal son is a great lesson for any sinner who needs to be restored uh, to God. A sinner or saint. Sometimes a saints uh, can get themselves caught up in a whole bunch of sin that separates their fellowship between them and God. And the only way they can get things made, back, made right with God is go back uh, and humble themselves before God once again. That's why we have altar calls, and I'm very proud of our church members. We have good responses. It doesn't take a lot of prodding and cajoling and pleading and begging and milking it for 25 minutes to see how many people get out of their seat, come down and pray a little while, and make business right with God. Right. I hate invitations that go on like that, too, by the way. I like it when people say, yes, I need to get up right now. I'll go right now. You can take care of a lot of spiritual business on your knees with God. Amen. But before, everything was a disaster. But after, after, point number four, he wanted to be a servant, but was treated as a son. Treated as a son. Verse 19, And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Paul wrote, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1.15 He knew he had been in the wrong. But then he wrote, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. If God can save me, he can use that to demonstrate to anybody else they can be saved too. That's how low Paul esteemed his own self, his own reputation. If God can rescue a rotten guy like me, maybe he can save other people too. But um, Paul would have been happy to only be a servant. God treated him as a favored son. 
uh, the Father said in our text, verses 22 to 24, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. That's true happiness. It seems to be true that the greater the sin, the greater the forgiveness. Romans 5, verse 20. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Back in Luke chapter 7, Christ told Simon, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Luke 7, verses 41 to 43. We sing, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. Amen. When you come to God as a sinner, willing to admit your guilt as a sinner, and confess your need for him, not try to hide it, not try to make an excuse and say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, but God, if you can see, no, no, no. That's not what God's looking for. He's not looking for someone to play games and compare yourself to somebody else. He's looking for you to admit you are, you are in need. You are, you're a sinner and you need God to forgive you. That's what he's looking for. But uh, he wanted to be a servant, but was treated like a son. Point number five today, let me say, after he wanted only bread, <clears throat> but received a banquet. Amen. He knew the servants, verse 17, quote, had bread enough and to spare. And then in verse 19, make me as one of thy hired servants. That's what he was going to tell his father. But before those words came out of his mouth, verse 23, the father said, Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered to the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. The Bible says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9, respectively. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your future is going to be a glorious banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb, with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Before, this young man was starving, ready to eat the pig slop. And after... He had a dinner back home prepared for him like none he'd ever had before. The lower you are, the higher God can raise you up. And when you recognize the guilt of your own soul and the guilt of your own sins, the greater and the more glorious the forgiveness can be when you finally receive it from God. But as long as someone tries to say, well, I'm glad I wasn't as bad as this guy. No, you're not going to enjoy the, the, the power of God forgiving you. Admit that you depend on him for everything. He wanted merely bread, but he was given a banquet. And point number six, last point today, after he wanted forgiveness but he was restored to full fellowship. Amen. Verse 20 said, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's what the Heavenly Father did for you when you turned to Jesus Christ, if you got saved. Amen. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How, my, how shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? The Bible tells us, for he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's good to be in fellowship with God. Yeah. It's miserable and painful to be out of fellowship with God. 
A sinner is forgiven of his sins, born again. The Holy Spirit of God comes inside to dwell forever. And that's just day one. It gets better after that. Think about that. The Holy Spirit is said to be the earnest of our expectation. That is the down payment of everything God intends to give you as a child of God. The third person of the Godhead, the same one who caused the, Jesus Christ to be conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the same one who moved over the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1, the same one who, by, by the new birth, lives in the, inside all Christians and unites them all together throughout the universe, heaven and on earth. When he comes to live inside of you, that's just the beginning of everything God intends to give you as a Christian one day. Amen. It's hard to wrap your mind around all of that, but it's nevertheless true. Someday the Bible promises this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. As a son, you have access to the throne of God that an unbeliever doesn't have. We read, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 1 John 5. Verses 14 and 15. When you're in good fellowship with someone, they don't take offense. Um, if you come to them and or call them when they're in the middle of something, right? The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, verse 16. You're not interrupting your father if you contact him while he's at work during the day because you have a special rapport with him that nobody else has. A mere servant can't do that. But the prodigal son who returns to his father, he finds forgiveness. He's put back into full fellowship once again. And so is a sinner who is made right with God. He goes from being dead to being alive that quickly. A marvelous transformation. Marvelous thing. In the, movie, in the movie Amazing Grace, the John Newton character, he tells William Wilberforce, Wilberforce, I know one thing. I'm a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. I suppose truer words were never spoken by Hollywood. The father told his other son, verse 32, For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. Before and after make all the difference, not only in the life of a sinner, but also in the life of a saint, who needs fellowship restored between him and God.